Well, hello again everybody, and today we're going to be building a very simple crystal oscillator that we can use to do the FM alignment of a radio. Well, unfortunately, due to unforeseen technical reasons, we have lost the introduction to this video, so you are actually going to have to join me part way in where we start the construction. So I'm going to cut out a piece of board. I think I've probably made this uh, quite a bit bigger than we need to, so I'm actually going to shrink it down a little bit. We're not taking any kind of uh, exact measurements because uh, I really just don't think it, it's going to matter. So something like that. I think we should have no problem fitting it into something about that size. Famous last words, eh? So we're going to use this guillotine, and I've got to admit this thing absolutely terrifies me. It's uh, basically just designed to remove fingers. <laughs> it really is quite a scary piece of, uh, well, garage equipment. It really shouldn't be used, it should be binned. should take this thing to the tip before I actually lose a finger. Well I'm not sure if this is actually going to work but what I thought I could do to try to make our island cutter I've got some of these wood drills and they've got kind of a sharp spurs on the outside of the edges of them here which is designed to actually cut through the wood grain. Now I'm not sure if this will work it's very much uh, just going to give it a try but I thought if we can actually just cut off the, uh, the point here and leave these two spurs remaining we might be able to make an island cutter. Well well let's try it I've got no idea. Well, as you can see, the islands that we've created, they are a little bit rough and ready, aren't they? Especially that one there where the drill got caught a little bit and wandered off. But luckily for us, electrons are blind and they really don't care about the aesthetics. And one important thing to check, though, is you just want to do a quick continuity check to actually see that you have removed all the copper between the islands and the, uh, the surrounding copper ground plane. Because if you've got shorts of copper in there, that could really ruin your day. Now, I don't think I'm going to bother checking these because... The drill that I used, it did actually cut one quite deeply and two, it cut quite a wide kerf. So I can see just with the naked eye that I have removed all the copper. But depending on how you've ground your drill, or maybe you've used a, like a more proprietary island cutter because you can buy them. Depending on the way you've done it, you might want to go ahead and just check that. So I think the next thing we're going to do is I'm, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to just tin all these little islands because uh, it's just going to make putting the components on easier. So just the other day I was watching somebody use a little stand to do some PCB assembly and I've never actually owned such a stand so I did go ahead and uh, well it was a bit limited to what I could actually buy but again these are available on Amazon and uh, I think they're dirt cheap they're like £6 or something they're not very expensive so uh, let's give this one a try and see if it's actually any good because as I say I've never actually used a PCB stand before and for those playing along at home this is manufactured by Duratool Okay, oh dear, looks like we're going to do some self-assembly. Okay, no instructions, but I'm going to take that as a good thing. Now, the main reason that I bought this little circuit board rotating stand is 
I do seem to be one of these people who suffers from rather jammy hands and fingers. So you know, you get a nice circuit board that you've made and uh, I just cover everything in jam very, very quickly and it makes it harder to solder to. So I thought that uh, probably in doing this we want to make it just, uh, you know, keep some of my finger jam off the copper clad circuit boards, which uh, should make the soldering a bit easier going forward. But on the other hand, I've always seen these things as being a little bit of a gimmick. So again, I'm going to use this for the first time and tell you what I think. So obviously, no instructions, that clearly goes like that. Are they metal or plastic? Well, that's good. I think the ends of these might actually be metal, so if you burn them with a soldering iron, it doesn't matter. So you can see that this end of the stand is actually spring loaded so the whole idea is you, uh, I think you tighten that up and it compresses the spring which grabs everything more tightly so you obviously do that and then we tighten these up and then get these undone. So it does seem to grab our board really quite firmly, it's got a little bit of wiggle waggle in it but um, I don't think that really matters does it? Um, it does seem to have got our board firmly and I'm guessing the big advantage of using something like this, we've all been there where we've tried to solder with just a circuit board on a flat table, especially something like a four mica table, you put the soldering iron against it and it starts to push the board across your table doesn't it and uh, you're chasing it with a soldering iron. So this does actually grab everything much more positive and you can maybe uh, also just present the board at at an angle that might be slightly more ergonomic for you. So uh, first impressions um, aren't bad. So I think these home assembly techniques are a little bit outdated now, especially with the invention of uh, you know very cheap manufacturing of printed circuit boards in China. If I actually send a board order for China, I can actually get it back in the same week. So it's not such a long delay and it costs dirt cheap. It would probably cost me almost as little as it is to bear, buy the bare board here in the UK. But of course the advantage is, much like today, I decided to build this on a Sunday morning and this technique just allows you to crack on and do a little bit of construction. Of course there's other, there's other methods of construction that we could have used. We could have actually built it what they call dead bug style where we put all the components on the backs where actually we're putting these components the correct way up so maybe that's slightly easier because you can look at the circuit diagram and depending on how you've drawn it you should get some uh, synergy between what you've drawn and the components that you're putting down. If you do it dead bug style everything's upside down and you've got to kind of reverse everything in your head but I'm not really going to say one technique is better than the other, they're just different techniques aren't they? So I did say I wasn't going to check the isolation of all these little islands but I guess it would be lax of me, why not, might save a problem later on. So there's the ground plane, fine, fine, fine. Okay, all good. Well I think it's time to go ahead and let's just place some components. I don't think I've got these pads quite optimally placed but uh, yeah, say la vie, it will do. Now I've actually got a couple of circuit diagrams here. This circuit diagram here is the one that um, George uses in his video. Uh, this is more of a, a crystal checker which Alan builds in one of his videos. I think I'm going to mainly go for the one that Alan uses because it's got a buffer stage which I think is probably quite useful because it's always nice to buffer the output from a, a crystal so you know what you connect to it isn't going to pull the frequency. I think I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to uh, glue the base down first for no real reason. Once you've got one of the, one of the component legs glued down the others go much easier. Now I've got to admit I've only put one transistor down so far. This does seem like quite a nice easy way of construction. I'm, uh, I'm quite enjoying this. It's good. So the next component we need, we need 100 ohms to our collector.
Now we need a 10 nanofarad to ground. I'll have to go and find one of them. So I'm sure that a lot of you people out there, you see us YouTube creators and uh, you think, God, they're awful at soldering, aren't they? But what you don't always see is that a lot of us have got, as I have today, we've got great big tripods in front of us. So this, uh, this circuit board isn't just in front of me. Um, what I've got in front of me is a big tripod with a camera on it. <laughs> and uh, what I'm having to do is I'm having to reach round to actually um, to reach this thing, which um, makes it harder, of course. Now before I actually started soldering on this board I did actually go ahead and just give it a good once over with a Brillo pad. It does make it obviously an awful lot easier if everything's clean. So this next component that I'm putting in is a 10k resistor. So this one is the, it's the positive side, it's the high side of our voltage divider which is biasing our transistor base. So the next component I'm going to put in is I'm going to put in our crystal, I'm trying to keep the leads on this relatively short. So I'm going to install the 470 picofarad capacitor next, this actually takes the feedback from the transistor back into the crystal and makes it oscillate. Now some of you are probably spotting this pad over here that I haven't used. Well that was actually to allow me to put some series capacitance in with this crystal if we need it because George has got that in his circuit which allows you to maybe just very slightly to pull the crystal frequency. Okay, so I think we should actually be in a position now to give this circuit a little test. Now, this is only the main oscillator side. We're actually going to install a buffer amplifier on this side, but I think we'll give it a test as it is, because we should be able to sniff for our 10.7 MHz crystal frequency. So with the meter set to the ohms range, I'm just going to check some of these component values are correct. So we should have 100 ohms to the collector. Well, 98 ohms, close enough. So we should have 10k from there to our base of our transistor, which we have, and we should have 20k to the other side of the voltage divider, which we have bang on 20k. So our emitter resistor between ground and the emitter should be 1k, which it is. And I'm just going to check that We've got our capacitors here connected correctly, so one is between the ground and the base of the transistor, which it is. Now hopefully we should have some wibbling. And for all you wibble fans out there, there's our oscillator. What frequency is it oscillating at? Hopefully it's somewhere near 10.7, which it is. And that's coming in at a 10.6966 megahertz. Well, I wonder if we can actually peak that a little bit, get it a little bit closer towards 10.7. Now I'm sure that'll be good enough for what we're trying to do but it'd be nice to get it banged on 10.7 wouldn't it? Well as you can see we've changed our crystal loading by adding a small capacitor so our output frequency is looking a little bit closer to 10.7 now. Well it's not absolutely important that we get the exact frequency for our marker generator but as you can see we have. So the next thing I'm going to do is build this little buffer amplifier. Now the reason that we've included this is because I'm actually going to use a telescopic whip antenna to actually alter the amplitude of the output waveform. I'm going to be able to control the coupling of the circuit which this is going to feed into. So I don't want changing the telescopic length of the antenna. I don't want that to load up this transistor here, this main oscillator transistor. I don't want to connect it directly to it because that would mean that perhaps if I messed with the antenna length it could actually physically, the changing capacitance could actually pull this frequency slightly and I don't want to do that. So if we actually use a buffer amplifier installed here it will just prevent that from happening. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. Well I think it's about time that I said that I've been absolutely stunned and staggered by the generosity of some of the people in our radio community. And in the last few months quite a number of people have actually donated things to the channel for which I'm eternally grateful. Now just some of them people include George Christoffer who's given me some test equipment that's going to feature shortly. Welcome to the channel. I'm George. It's on fire because it's a hot radio. Now another person is Paul at the Cody's channel and he's also given me a piece of test equipment which will feature shortly in a video. Hello, 
and welcome to Cody's Radio Workshop. And then we've also got Sean at the Man Cave Workshop who's donated this Hunter Hacker Radio. And this is actually my first battery portable set. And as you can see, I'm quite happily torturing that radio with the marker generator that we've just built. Oh yes, that looks much better like that. And of course we've got Graham, the radio cruncher, who did donate a great big box of bits and pieces to me, including this CB radio. And as you'll also know, there's been quite a few other people that have donated bits and pieces to the channel that we've all enjoyed looking at. But what you're looking at right now is a Philips PM5324, and it's a HF generator. But it's actually a very special type of RF generator in that it's a swept generator. So some people do call these sweep generators, and other people call them wobulators that you may have heard of. Now the important thing about this type of RF generator is that its frequency alters. It automatically goes up and down. Now certain types of equipment, which will often include things like televisions, communication receivers, and in fact FM receivers and stereo receivers, they call up for a very, very definite type of alignment process and they actually call up the use of a sweep generator. Now for the most part a sweep generator does operate in a very, very similar way to a traditional HF signal generator in that you've got a needle pointer here which shows you what they call the centre frequency. But if you were to look at the output of this on say a frequency counter you would see that the output isn't just one fixed frequency. What this is actually doing is starting off at a low frequency, it's going up to the centre frequency, and then it's going to go past it to a high frequency. So effectively, the frequency output is wobbling up and down, it's increasing and decreasing, and that's very, very useful for carrying out IF alignment on radios. Now I'd actually been looking for one of these sweep signal generators for more than a year and I hadn't been able to find one. So you can imagine how pleased and excited I was that when Simon Spears actually got in contact with me and he said that he had one of these sweep generators. And, uh, he had a couple of sweep generators and he had one that he wasn't using very much. Would I like to have it? But remember this is a sweep generator uh, and basically the wobulator sweeps around a centre frequency. Uh, as you can see on this display at the bottom here we're centered at 10.7 megahertz and we're sweeping either side of 10.7 oh, yeah. megahertz. I think, even if I do say so myself, it's a pretty good S curve. But you see, this is the discriminator that makes the big, it has the biggest influence in the center position of that marker. So Simon Spears has very generously donated this signal generator to me and I can only say I'm absolutely thrilled with his generosity. So thank you very much. Now I'm not going to go into details of how this operates today for the simple reason that I'm still learning myself. The main use of this is for aligning FM radios and really doing something called S-curves. Now I don't know enough about S-curves to really tell you about them but I do hope to find out in the future. So what you're actually seeing on the oscilloscope screen here, you're seeing the response of the FM discriminator from having its input frequency swept when you actually align one of these FM discriminators you actually have to get the centre of the S curve here to be about 10.7 megahertz but the problem with using a sweep general like this is you don't actually know where 10.7 megahertz is so that was the whole point in the marker generator that we've just built so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to plug my marker generator in and it's quite hard to see but what you'll see is you'll see a little bit of distortion occurring and where that distortion occurs that's going to be the 10.7 megahertz point on our oscilloscope display. So you can probably see that on our S curve here there's a little bit of distortion occurring. It's a bit hard to see but there's a little bit of a ripple occurring. So that point there is actually about 10.7 megahertz. Well it's not about, it's dead on 10.7 megahertz. So that's the signal that's coming out of the little crystal oscillator that we've just built. So what we need to do now is we actually need to trim the frequency control on the on the sweep generator because we're, what we're trying to do is we're trying to get that little wibbly part there in the centre of our scope. So I've just done that now so we now know that this point here is absolutely bang on that's 10.7 megahertz so we could now go ahead having set that position we could now go ahead and start to uh, spanner on this radio to set up this S curve more perfectly. 
Well, for today, I'm not actually going to adjust the discriminator on this radio because one, I'm still learning how to do it. But two, you actually have to follow the alignment instructions very carefully. And the way that I'm actually injecting the signal at the moment, it's not in accordance with the way it tells you to do it in the manual. I've just done it this way because it saves on soldering components and it was just quick. But I think it does show us that this marker generator is working. So I've actually just disconnected the marker generator. So I'm just going to put it back in now. And I found that we tend to get the best coupling if we just actually just stick it in here into the module. And now I've just fed that little antenna into the radio module box. Again, you can now see that our little, little wibbly wobbly line, it's appeared and it's dead on centre. So again, we know that this point here is 10.7 megahertz. So I'm just going to disconnect the battery from our marker generator again. And you should see this, this marker disappear. So they call this little wibbly point here, they call it a marker. So I'm just going to disconnect it and it's going to disappear. Now depending on the type of alignment that you're doing, you may need more than one marker generator because this one has been set to, uh, well, 10.7 megahertz. But if you're working on things like televisions or something like that, you would need a marker generator of a different frequency. So it's not uncommon to build lots of different ones of these, all with different crystals in them. So that was just an example, really, of how to build one. And uh, as I say, I actually didn't invent this circuit or anything like it. This comes from watching uh, Alan's website and also from watching Chris, uh, Chris Stoffy build his marker generator. Well, as you can see, with the aid of my 3D printer, I've just gone ahead and uh, I've just knocked up a little box for this. And I do think it's quite important to bother to put your projects in a box because if you just leave them floating around on the bench like this, uh, they just become scrap and, uh, you know, you don't value them. So I do think this might be quite useful, even though it's such a simple circuit. I hope to use this in the future, so we've made a box for it. So let's go ahead and stick that in there. Now, my idea was we can actually just solder one side of the, uh, the BNC connector onto the circuit board ground plane. Now originally I was going to put a little telescopic aerial on here but I thought if I did that that would actually limit my ability to couple this little uh, marker generator into various circuits. So what I can do is if I just want to have a piece of wire as an antenna I can actually plug a BNC mounted antenna into here which I've got some of them or I can actually just plug in a BNC connector with a wire coming out of it so I think that probably just makes it a little bit more flexible for me. I have to try and do this fairly quickly or it's going to end up melting through the bottom of my 3D printed box because the uh, obviously you've got to be a bit careful on temperature with these things. Hopefully that will have done it. Okay I think that looks okay. What we might do is when we've finished assembling it we'll put a dab of hot melt glue on there. I think that'll be fine. And uh, here's our centre pin connection. Here's our output connection. Okay, I think that board's going to stay in there. Maybe a, a dab extra of hot melt glue would do. Now, I think I just want to decide which switch contacts I want to use. I think I want the uh, the little switch here. I want that pointing towards the LED. I think that's going to be my on indicator. So it's going to be that pair, isn't it? So this is the kind of thing that I'm definitely going to leave switched on and let the batteries go flat. So I am actually adding a, a power indicator to uh, so I can see when it's actually turned on. Of course that won't actually prevent me from leaving it switched on and will just drain the batteries even quicker, but um, hmm, so it goes. So I did actually forget to mention earlier that another really good use for this little circuit is actually use it as a crystal um, tester. So rather than having a fixed crystal installed in here like I've done, what you could actually do is just install a little socket so that you can actually plug in a crystal and uh, then the output BNC connector you just connect to an oscilloscope or a frequency counter. So you've got a box of crystals and you're not sure what they are or whether or not they're working, um, you could actually build a little a crystal tester. Well I've got to admit I'm not sure I'd go to the trouble of building a crystal tester myself because I think that um, well most crystals like this one have the actual frequency written on the side of them and really there's no better way to test a crystal than having it installed in the circuit it's already in because that's where it's designed to work because crystals can be a little bit finicky when you move them from one circuit to another so just because it works in this crystal tester wouldn't necessarily guarantee it to work in your piece of equipment but I know a lot of people do make crystal testers and they are quite a popular little project. 
So the next very non-critical component I'm going to install is just a current limiting resistor for our little LED here and I think it's something like 1.2k, something like that. I tried to set the current quite low for this LED because I say we don't want to uh, we don't want to wear out the battery just running our little green LED here. Although in fairness that is a pretty good reason. And I think we will go for the old J hook because that's easy. We may as well uh, we may as well solder our wire from our battery onto there for our zero volt connection. And uh, just for good practice, we'll snake our power supply wiring as much around the circuit board and around the oscillator as much as possible because uh, that's a great idea. That's going to go to about there. Well, the light works anyway. What I think I might do just to finish off with, I think I might just also just tack a diode in circuit here because when you're installing these battery clips it is quite easy just to kind of push them against each other the other way around. I think it's quite unlikely it would actually do any damage to this circuit because we have got some current limiting resistors. But um, diodes are very cheap so we may as well just drop one in. Well I know at this point we are somewhat gilding the lily a little bit but let's face it, soldering's fun isn't it? We like constructing things so I don't mind spending a little bit more time soldering. So I think that's uh, done. We just need to check that I haven't installed the dial the wrong way around which is my typical way of doing things. No, nope, still lights up, that's fine. Well let's face it, this thing has got a face that only a mother could love but I'm sure it'll work fine. Well it's been several hours since I've managed to squirt hot melt glue all over my hand so I thought we may as well just go ahead and do that now. A little bit of hot snot there and a little bit down there. And I think we might also go ahead and just put some hot snot down here, quite a generous blob just to retain some of the wires from our battery. And I think we'll also just put a little dab here on the back of the LED. Sure that'll be fine. And uh, do we need one on the board down there? Well why not? Doesn't cost anything does it? So here's the telescopic antenna that I planned on using but um, this is actually a little bit on the big side isn't it? We don't really want that I don't think. Kind of just too big so we won't worry about that. So instead of that I think we'll just use a piece of wire that we used earlier, I think that's good enough for what we're doing. And uh, we'll give it one more test and then we will call it a day. Now for anybody who does want to have a go at building one of these, uh, I will leave the circuit diagram at the end. So if you do want to find out what the component values are, you can of course do that. Now most of the component values aren't very important, so just use what you've got, the nearest thing in the junk box. As a final test let's just plug it into our spectrum analyzer. Shouldn't do any damage because it's a very low output level. Switch on. And if we just switch on there you can see our signal at 10.7 MHz and we're at minus 7.2 dBm at the moment which is, well that's probably around 90 microvolts. It's in the ballpark of that. And because we are directly connected to the spectrum analyzer that's into a 50 ohm load so the actual output voltage would be uh, would be a little bit higher if it was just into an antenna or something like that. So I'm sure you'll agree that this was just a very simple and straightforward project that we've built today. Now the main reason that I built it is because this is something that I actually did need. So we're going to use this when I have a go at doing some FM alignment on a on FM receivers in the future. So we'll be using this again with my sweet generator which as I said earlier Simon Spears very very generously donated to the channel. So I will put um, links to Simon's channel in my show notes. Also a link to uh, Chris Christoffi who built a slightly different version of this and uh, also Alan's video which I copied from very very heavily. And uh, if you go and watch their videos they will give you better of explanations of how this circuit works 
and uh, where you can use it. So go and watch their videos, that would only be fair. Now the other thing to mention is just this little island construction method that we used. That does seem to work quite well and I probably would certainly recommend that for simple little RF projects going forward. I think it is a bit limited to the number of components you could really put on a board um, because it, it uses you know quite big islands. I suppose you could make smaller islands if you wanted but certainly it's an alternative to building stuff dead bug style and it's certainly a technique which I think that I will be uh, I'll be using again in the future. Maybe if I was to do more of these I would actually go ahead and I would actually purchase a little island cutter um, because you can purchase these and they, they work a lot like little tiny hole saws so if I was going to use this technique more I would probably go ahead and, and buy an island cutter but I think for today that worked well. Now of course the other thing that I used for the first time today was this little Jura tool um, board holder rotator PCB holder yes I was grappling for the words there uh, very very low cost but I can certainly say that this would have its usage um, I don't think you can complain for the price it, it certainly does make uh, assembling PCBs uh, much easier than I would have thought I wish I'd actually bought one of these in the past so this also gets a, a thumbs up from me it, it works fine no problem with that well, I think for today that's enough waffling on from me. That'll do. So until next time, bye bye for now.